Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Richard Legro at Penn State College of Medicine, and I'm going to talk to you today about why I think Leprazole should be the first line of infertility treatment in women with polycystic ovary syndrome. So there is no shortage of therapies to treat polycystic uh, ovary syndrome. We have therapies that we think primarily work at the hypothalamic pituitary axis, i.e. clomiphene, aromatase inhibitors like Leprazole, pulsatile GnRH. We have therapies that work directly on the ovary, such as FSH or ovarian diathermy. And then we have therapies that we think likely work at multiple uh, points in the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, such as weight loss, uh, lifestyle modification, insulin sensitizing agents such as metformin. The question is, what should be the first line therapy? Well, we do need low cost, safe and effective infertility therapies. We see an increasing utilization for, of uh, in vitro fertilization for women with ovulatory dysfunction. We don't know if the reason for this is the failure of first-line therapy or the unwillingness of patients and practitioners to attempt multiple cycles of ovulation induction therapy. But ideally, IVF was created to treat uh, tubal abnormalities, not uh, ovulatory dysfunction. And currently in the U.S., we have very high multiple pregnancy rates with IVF in the range of 20 to 30 uh, percent, compared to much lower rates, i.e. 5 to 7 percent with ovulation induction therapy. So the rationale for aromatase inhibitors are multifold. They work perhaps similarly to clomiphene by blocking or reducing inappropriate estrogen feedback at the hypothalamus. This uh, results in a corresponding rise in FSH secretion, a relative normalization of FSH to LH, and induction of ovulation, i.e. development of ovarian follicles. It's potentially preferable to clomiphene because it has a much shorter and a much simpler metabolism, much shorter half-life and simpler metabolism than clomiphene. And that theoretically gives less early pregnancy exposure to the drug. Also, there is likely no cumulative effects uh, due to the re relatively rapid clearance of letrozole out of the blood. Also, it's been uh, theorized and small studies have supported that there may be more monofollicular ovulation with aromatase inhibitors, such as letrozole and clomiphene, and that there may be more favorable endometrial effects. So recently, I was a principal investigator of a large multicenter study uh, conducted by the Reproductive Medicine Network. This is a double-blind, controlled, uh, randomized study that randomized women with PCOS to either letrozole or clomiphene. And the primary endpoint was live birth. The letrozole resulted in a nearly 10% absolute improvement in the live birth rate over the period of the study compared to clomiphene. And this was a nearly 44% relative improvement in the live birth rate with letrozole compared to clomiphene. We did a post hoc analysis in which we divided up our group into a lower, mid, and upper tertile of BMI. And again, I think if you look at the life table analysis for each of the BMI groups, you'll see that letrozole is the same or superior to clomiphene at all weight groups. Even with the reduction in power by the tertile splitting of the study group, we still saw a significant improvement in the mid-tertile range. One of the big concerns about letrozole has been a concern about an increased congenital anomaly rate. As many of you are aware of, this was based on a abstract presented at ASRM over 10 years ago that was never published. But this did result in a black box warning for letrozole in many places throughout the world. What we've done now in the Reproductive Medicine Network is conduct two large studies that have incorporated letrozole as a treatment agent, both for women with PCOS in our Pregnancy and Polycystic Ovary Syndrome 2 study that I just showed you, and then in a large study of 900 couples uh, who were treated for unexplained infertility in, in our Amigos study. Both of these studies can be found in, in the New England Journal and are referenced at the end of this presentation. What's important to note is that the rate was slightly higher with letrozole in women with PCOS and then slightly higher with clomiphene in women with unexplained infertility. But I think the take-home message here is that the congenital anomaly rates were within expected limits, both in women who are infertile and in women who also conceive spontaneously. 
and were relatively low with no significant differences uh, compared to clomiphene or gonadotropins in the amigos study. Thus, uh, uh, given in a uh, controlled fashion and not given to women who are pregnant, leprazole in our experience is equally as safe as clomiphene and gonadotropins in terms of the congenital anomaly rate. The findings of our large study, I think, have been confirmed by uh, several other randomized controlled trials that have been done with leprazole and clomiphene. In fact, if you look at the most recent uh, Cochrane systematic review, the overall effect is a, a approximately 60% improvement in the live birth rate with leprazole compared to clomiphene, so slightly higher than in our trial. I think the other thing that's come out of a more recent uh, meta-analysis is there have been no differences in the multiple pregnancy, miscarriage, and ovulation rates between the two groups. So the question is, why is letrozole better than clomiphene as a ovulation induction agent? Well, our impression, based on studies that we did both before and after ovulation, in which patients were characterized both by ultrasound and by a series of assays for various hormones, including progesterone, estradiol, testosterone, and anti-malarian hormone, is that you get a better ovulation for implantation after letrozole than clomiphene. So in the mid-luteal phase, after ovulating with letrozole, women have higher progesterone and lower estradiol levels, so a more favorable hormonal implantation milieu. The other thing that happens with letrozole is that actually there are lower antral follicle counts and lower AMH levels after ovulation with letrozole with clomiphene. And perhaps they're establishing a more normal ovarian environment by lowering the number of follicles and AMH levels. Against hypothesis, actually, in the luteal phase, the endometrium compared to after ovulation or after exposure to letrozole is actually somewhat thinner than after exposure or ovulation with clomiphene. So the theory that there's a thicker endometrium with letrozole didn't really hold up in our study. And it might mean that perhaps we're overanalyzing the thickness of the endometrium and its predictive value for pregnancy in women with PCOS. So our references are provided here. And uh, thank you for paying attention to this presentation.